Good morning, friends. Welcome to the worship service of the Beacon Christian Church community, a faith community dedicated to being witnesses and disciples who show love and kindness and do justice in the name of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful that you've chosen to be a part of our community today, whether you're watching with us at 930 on Sunday morning, or if you're watching this video at some other point in time, we believe that through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we're truly worshiping as one faith community. Please take a moment to fill out our digital connection card, and you can find that at beaconlex.org connection. And there's a link to that in the video description as well. That just gives us a chance to connect with you to see how we can pray for you, how we can be encouraging you, and how we can serve you as a faith community. We also want to make you aware that you can pull up our bulletin for today's service. That has today's order of service in it and has some important announcements in it as well. You can get that at beaconlex.org slash bulletin, and you can find a link to that in the video description as well. As we turn our hearts and minds towards Jesus this morning, I invite you to put aside everything that you might have brought in that's bothering you, that's uh, concerning you, that's weighing heavily on your heart or your mind, and I ask that you set that aside so that you can focus fully on Jesus. And as you prepare your hearts for worship, hear the words of our call to worship from the book of Psalms this morning. Psalms 138, I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name for your unfailing love and faithfulness, for your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. Every king in all the earth will thank you, Lord, for all of them will hear your words. Yes, they will sing about the Lord's ways, for the glory of the Lord is very great. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. Though I am surrounded by trouble, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me. The Lord will work out his plans for my life, for your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. Please pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we praise you for all that you've provided for us, for every good gift that you've given. But we also admit that there are many things in our world today that trouble us in our hearts and minds and spirits. We thank you that you always hear us and we bring these troubles to you. We pray for the poor and the hungry and the neglected all over the world that their cries for daily bread may inspire works of compassion and mercy among those of us to whom much has been given. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for schools and centers of learning throughout the world, for schools trying to navigate the pandemic, for those who lack access to basic education, and for the light of knowledge to blossom and shine in the lives of all God's people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to the division and inequalities that scar God's creation, particularly the barriers to freedom faced by God's children throughout the world because of gender or race or ethnicity, that all who have been formed in God's image might have equality in pursuit of the blessings of creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the health of women, children, and families around the world, especially for an end to maternal and child mortality that in building healthy families, all God's people may be empowered to strengthen their communities and repair the breaches which divide nations and peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to pandemic disease throughout the world, particularly the coronavirus, but also the scourges of HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, that plagues of death may no longer fuel poverty or destabilize nations or inhibit the reconciliation and restoration throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for an end to the waste and desecration of God's creation, for access to the fruits of creation to be shared equally among all people, and for communities and nations to find sustenance in the fruits of the earth and the water God has given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all nations and people groups who already enjoy the abundance of creation, who already enjoy the blessings of prosperity, that their hearts may be lifted up to the needs of the poor and the afflicted, and that partnerships between rich and poor for the reconciliation of the world may flourish and grow. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all these things in the all-powerful name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught his followers to pray this prayer that we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, hey, good morning, Beacon. It is so good to worship with you today. So uh, again, I'd like to take this time. Uh, I'll play a couple of chords, and I invite you to, if you haven't already, uh, please consider tithing to Beacon. Um, also, again, take a moment to fill out our greeting cards. I probably said the wrong thing again, and I'm sorry. Uh, the correct title of the cards and the link will pop up right below. Um, so, again, uh, take this moment as an opportunity to tithe, and I'll play a couple chords, and then we'll get into worship. And again, it's good to be with you today. And for you, those of you at home with your coffee, I've got my mug too. So, so let's prepare our hearts, and let's come before the Lord. And now, if you will, join me as we sing, He Leadeth Me. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words, with heavenly comfort fraught. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words, with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom. By water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would place my hand in thine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, since it is my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by his grace the victory's won, 
Even death's cold wave, I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Amen. And now I invite you to join with me as we sing How Great Thou Art. I have noticed while preparing for worship this week that I have not sung this song in forever. Um, I'm kind of actually surprised it's taken me so long to get around to doing this. So if you will, please join with me as we sing How Great Thou Art. my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, sent him to die, to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great you are then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Amen.
we will now join in a time of confession for our sins and our shortcomings. And we do this not to label ourselves or other people as being horrible people, but rather we do this as an acknowledgement of how much we need God and how much we need one another. Confession reminds us that we have no grounds for pride or for self-righteousness because we all fall short of perfectly loving God and perfectly loving others. Today's confession is a responsive reading, and so when the words appear on your screen, I ask that you would respond with the designated words so that we can confess both as individuals and as a community. O oh Lord, listen to our prayer of confession, for we speak honestly before you. We confess that we haven't always done what is right that some of our attitudes and actions have hurt others and ourselves and have grieved you. In your mercy, look deeply into our hearts, examine our thoughts and our actions, test our motivations, bring to light all the things in our lives that dishonor you. Forgive us. Friends, our God never fails to hear us when we call to him. When we confess, he forgives trust in his forgiveness and unfailing love, and be at peace, for he rescues all who take refuge in him. Amen. We're going to go ahead and have our children's message now, so if you've got kids watching, go ahead and have them gather around so they can see and hear. And today we're going to talk about a man named Elisha. And Elisha lived in Israel during a time when the kingdom of Israel was at war with the kingdom of Aram. But every time that Aram would go to attack the kingdom of Israel, Elisha warned the king of Israel each time so that they were ready. So whenever the army of Aram came to attack Israel, the Israelites already knew what they were going to do and where they were going to be. And obviously this made the king of Aram very unhappy. So he sent men to capture Elisha. The king sent horses and chariots and a great big army to surround the city where Elisha was staying. And one morning, Elisha's servant went out and saw this huge army surrounding the city. And he said to Elijah, Master, what are we going to do? And Elisha says to him, Don't be afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but if I walked out my front door in the morning and saw a huge army with horses and chariots surrounding me, I would probably be afraid. But Elisha said, Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and asked God to open the servant's eyes. And the Lord answers, answered Elisha's prayer. And when the servant looked out, he saw an even bigger army of horses and chariots of fire that were protecting him and Elisha and the people of Israel. And so as the Aramean army came toward Elisha, he prayed, Lord, strike them with blindness. And that's exactly what happened. And then Elisha played a little trick on them. He told the Aramean army, this isn't the road to the city. Follow me and I'll lead you to the man that you're looking for. You know, even though Elisha was actually the man they were looking for. But Elisha led this army right into Israel's hands. But instead of killing the Aramean soldiers, Elisha told the king of Israel to prepare a huge feast for them. Instead of killing them and treating them in a terrible way, they actually gave them a party. And when they finished eating and drinking, the soldiers returned to their master, to the king of Aram, and told them all that had happened. And after that, the soldiers stopped raiding Israel's territory. You see, when the Aramean army found themselves captured, they expected to be treated exactly in the terrible way that they would have treated Elisha if they had captured him. But they received kindness instead. Had the king of Israel killed the men, the war would have just kept going on with one army killing the other soldiers and then that army retaliating and killing the soldiers of the first army. But Elisha's goal was to show the goodness of God in this situation. And because they showed love and kindness, the other army stopped attacking. And the goal was the same thing for us, to show the goodness and love and kindness and justice of God throughout the world. We don't do that by doing more wrong to people who have wronged us. 
We do it by showing kindness. Heavenly Father, even when we're dealing with our enemies, please help us to show your goodness by not returning evil for evil, but by showing love and kindness even when it's hard. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. And again, thank you very much for tuning in to today's church service. At this point, we'll be going to the scripture reading of today's service, and we'll be reading from 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. At the end of this portion of the service, I will say the phrase, This is the word of God for the people of God. I ask those of you who are back at home to respond back by saying it. Thanks be to God. Okay, let's get into the reading of God's word, starting with verse 8. When the king of Aram was waging war against Israel, he conferred with his servants, My camp will be at such and such a place. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Be careful passing by this place, for the Ar Arameans are going down there. Consequently, the king of Israel sent word to the place the man of God had told him about. The man of God repeatedly warned the king, so the king would be on his guard. The king of Aram was enraged because of this matter, and he called his servants and demanded of them, Tell me, which one of us is for is for the king of Israel. One of his servants said, No one, my lord, the king. Elisha, the prophet in, in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in your bedroom. So the king said, Go and see where he is, so I can send men to capture him. When he was told Elisha is in Dothan, he sent horses, chariots, and a massive army there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. So he asked Elisha, Elisha, Oh, my master, what are we to do? Elisha said, Don't be afraid, for those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. When the Arameans came against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Please strike this nation with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, according to Elisha's word. Then Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will take you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. When they entered Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open these men's eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw that they were in the middle of Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, Should I kill them? Should I kill them, my father? Elisha replied, Don't kill them. Do you kill those you have captured with your sword or your bow? Set food and water in front of them so that they can eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a big feast for them. When they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. The Aramean raiders did not come to Israel's land again. This is the word of God for the people of God. So thank you again so much for joining us. Um, it is my pleasure to deliver the word of, of God today. So if you will, let's go to before God in prayer before we get started uh, with the sermon. Thank you. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much that though we are at different parts, it is your same spirit that calls us. It's your same spirit that brings uh, heaven down to us. It's your spirit that brings us to heaven as well, that we can delight in you. So we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this message. Continue you to be with us. Grant us ears to hear, hearts to receive, and eyes to see. But also grant us mouths to proclaim your gospel, mouths to proclaim the truth that you would have us, and hands to be willing to work that as well. We thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the technology that allows us to worship together, to proclaim your gospel together, and soon to be able to partake of your Eucharist together. So thank you, Father. Amen. So in the reading that we had today, it's kind of one of those obscure places in Scripture we're going to. Uh, the lexicon, If I hope I got that word right. If not, you know, this is the second time in the service that I've gotten the word wrong. It's either the lectionary or the lexicon. I think it's the lexicon. No, it's the lectionary. See? See, <laughs> not enough coffee today. So um, that was what the lectionary had us um, preach from today. And it's one of those that I didn't really know where to go with it. Again, it's, it's in Second Kings. We don't go there all that often. It's one of the historical books. 
And given that they're historical in nature, they're often the most contested books in nature. So it's quite easy to get bogged down in the details about did it actually happen or not. And so the approach I'm going to take is that the approach of what we're reading is accurate. And the reason why is because if I come at it from any other approach, we're not going to be able to hear what the original audience heard. So whether or not the book of 2 Kings happens as it happens is not my concern today in today's sermon. Today's sermon is about how would, how would the original audience hear it? What would they have heard? And going from there, we can then experience the truth that the author, through the Holy Spirit, is trying to convey to them. So let's go forward with this. First things first, let's talk a little bit about Elisha. Uh, he's one of the unknown people. And it's, it's not really our fault, kind of, for not knowing him. Yes, I mean, it is shame on us for not knowing everybody in the Bible. Uh, it is, after all, an incredibly long book. So every so often, somebody just kind of slips away. Uh, one of the reasons why we don't know so much about Elisha is because he stands in the shadow of his teacher, his discipler, Elijah. Now, Elijah, we're all familiar with. He's the one that um, took on the prophets of Baal and that epic battle that he had on the mountain about, you know, whosoever God is real, let that God light the fire of the altar uh, and burn the sacrifices. So we have that. He has clearly defined villains, if I can say. Uh, Elijah goes up his whole life. He's fighting Ahab, the incompetent one, and his manipulative wife, Jezebel, and her scheming and her grasping for power. So Elijah is contrasted against the, the corrupted Ahab who should be obeying the law of God, who is supposed to be worshiping God, but he doesn't. He turns away from God and he worships the God of Baal, who happens to be Jezebel's. So Elijah has this contrast. Uh, his reads in a much more better narrative. Elisha doesn't have that. Um, he goes through several kings. Uh, there's about four different monarchies that he goes through. So there's not that consistency that Elijah has. And just like I said, narrative-wise, Elijah has an amazing story. I mean, the guy doesn't even die. He gets taken away at the end of his life. He gets taken away by a flaming chariot up into heaven. Like, that's climatic. That's something. Um, Elisha actually does miraculous wonders. He gets a double portion of the Holy Spirit that was imparted to Elijah. It gets imparted to Elisha. Elijah just does all this amazing stuff, but he's overshadowed by Elijah. Um, even the prof, even Jesus is compared to Elijah. They, they look for a prophet after Elijah, not after Elisha. Something else that makes Elijah stand out is the fact that Elijah has a successful disciple. Elisha does not have a successful disciple. His disciple doesn't go on to fame and glory, whereas Elijah's did. So, so that's the reason. If you're feeling bad for not knowing who Elisha is, uh, he's a great guy to, to read about. If you're looking to read about him, uh, pick up the last few chapters of 1 Kings and go through 2 Kings and you can discover Elisha. He, he is, he's pretty cool and well worth knowing about. So let's get into the text now. We know a little bit about Elisha. Uh, up to this point, he's actually done quite a few miracles. There was a Gentile that uh, had a severe skin condition that Elisha healed. Uh, he went to a widow and brought back her uh, son to life. He's been confidant to the king. The king has spoken to him. The king has tried to capture him, actually. Um, and so he's done quite a bit up to this point. But now let's see what's going on. So... Let's dive into the text. So it starts off war. Um, oh, another thing you should probably know is that Israel is not a united nation right now. Uh, Solomon was the last king to see Israel united. Uh, his son really messed things up, uh, caused a bit of a civil war. And now you have the northern ten tribes and the southern two tribes. And so Elisha, his story is taking place in the northern tribes. So you're going to hear places like Samaria. That's in the northern region of Israel. Ah, see? Guy gets a coffee. That's one of the wonderful things about preaching from home is from a pulpit, it looks kind of odd when a pastor brings out the mug and has a swig of coffee. But being at home, it just kind of seems natural. 
you have a fence, I'm very sorry. Please make mention in the comment section. I will read them, and I will take the note, and I can see what I can do about them. Thank you very much. So, um, anyways, let's get to the text. Now, the king of Aram was waging war against Israel. Now, this is kind of sad because they were kind of buddies at one point. Earlier in the chapter, in fact, Elisha heals a man from Aram earlier. So it says, when the king of Aram was waging war against Israel, he conferred with his servants. My camp will be at such and such a place. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel. Be careful passing by the place, for the Aramians are going down there. Consequently, the king of Israel sent word to the place the man of God had told him about. The man of God repeatedly warned the king, so the king would be on his guard. The king of Aram was enraged because of this matter. He called his servants and demanded of them, Tell me, which one of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, No one, my lord, the king. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, he tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in your bedroom. Elisha is aware of the ambushes. Oh, sorry. One of his servants. Oh, sorry. Now I'm getting into my notes. I'm sorry. Maybe I should not have had coffee before preaching. I'm sorry if I'm a little energetic, but hey, let's get through it. It's Sunday morning, right? It's Sunday morning. So what's happening is raiding parties were incredibly destructive at this time. These aren't what the king of Aram is doing is he's not quite doing a full on invasion, trying to capture cities. Instead, what he's doing is he's targeting agricultural areas. He's targeting farmlands. He's destroying crops, um, places where they gather and make food reservations. It's, it's really kind of a jerk move that he's doing. Uh, give, at this time period, you don't, Israel isn't big enough to really be on like the manufacturing side. Manufacturing won't really become an uh, economic staple until much later in history. At this time period, countries, the main source of trade and the main source of st uh, sustaining themselves is the crops. They're agricultural people. So to have people raiding your crops during this time, it was very destructive not only for keeping the country well fed, but it's also destructive uh, to the country's economy. So Aram, what he's doing is Israel and Aram used to be buddies and they used to go to war against Moab and other people. But the king of Israel has to know he's set back. He doesn't want to fight them anymore. So Aram is, well, hey, if you're not going to help me, I'm going to burn some of your crops. So that's what's going on. God has been revealing to Elisha where these attacks are going to happen. And the king of Israel is able to send troops down and he's able to thwart these attacks. They're getting so bad that the king of Aram is convinced that there's a spy in his midst, that somebody is telling him these secrets. Now, when he's, the servant says, no, it's Elisha, the prophet in Israel, Elisha has a reputation in Aram. That's why the king isn't questioning him at this point. When he hears that all of a sudden the man who healed one of his servants, the man who's brought back a widow's son to life, the man who has thwarted even Israel's army, has his know-abouts, the king doesn't question it. The king has confidence in his own servants that he's like, oh, it's Elisha that's doing this to me. Now, I, I have to get to this where it says the man of God repeatedly warned the king. Um, the NIV translates it time and again. Uh, the NIV, the man of God repeatedly warned the king, doesn't quite do justice as to how often this was happening. The NIV captures it a bit better than what my translation does it. It's repeatedly, it's often, this has happened several times. It wasn't just once or twice. This is a continuation of attacks. God was supplying, I read that part, See, maybe I shouldn't have coffee. Okay, this is a confession on my part. I should probably stay away from coffee when trying to um, preach. I'm just feeling really good right now. So I'll try slowing down just a little bit. So what happened is this is an ongoing thing. These are constant attacks by Aram into Israel. It's proving at this point that even though the king of Israel knows that these attacks are coming, they're not stopping. Aram is, the king of Aram is not about to stop for anything at this point. He wants to teach Israel a lesson, and he's going to keep coming at Israel until Israel gets the hint and backs them up in Aram's wars. 
So the servant says, no, no, dude, it's none of us. We're all on your side. It's the guy, Elisha. He's the one telling this information. So the king doesn't hesitate. He takes action. So the king said, uh, this is, sorry, this is verse 13. So the king said, go and see where he is so I can send men to capture him. When he was told Elisha is in Dothan, he sent horses, chariots, and a massive army there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of God, no, when the servant of the man of God got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. So he asked Elisha, oh, my master, what are we to do? Elisha said, don't be afraid, for those who are with us outnumbered those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So the king is not wasting any time. He is serious about punishing Israel for backing or for dropping out of their military alliance that they had. So as soon as he discovers where Elisha is, he's sending an army. And it spares no details. It says horses and chariots. Chariots are kind of the tanks. They're the tanks of this day and age. Um, when we had sent, uh, if you remember, uh, when Osama bin Laden was taken out by the SEAL team, we had sent helicopters in with the SEALs team to covertly take him out. The king... If the king was in command of that operation, he would have not have sent a couple of Black Hawk helicopters filled with seals. What this is saying is if he found out where he was, he was, is sending an army. He is sending tanks. He is sending F-16s or F-18s, whatever they are today. He is sending a massive army to surround the city. He's not going to let Elisha escape. He's going with everything he's got. This is a massive army. It's not a raiding party at this point. It is the king of Aram sending his army to take out Elisha. Now, what's interesting is we have to ask ourselves, how is Elisha caught off guard? Up to this point, he has known where all the raiding parties have been. How does an army, an army that's bigger than the raiding parties, how does an army catch this man off guard? So we have to ask ourselves, either Elisha knew that the army was coming or God withheld the information from him as a test to Elisha to see if he had faith in God. So I don't think at this point that we can consider God not showing Elisha the information. Because up to this point in the narrative, God has been consistently giving Elisha that information. Up to this point in the book of Kings, Elisha himself has proved time and time again that he's a man of God. He's, he's even tempted with a major sum of money and wealth and prestige and power, and he denies it. He rejects it because he doesn't consider it as something pleasing to God. So Elisha's faith to this point has been stellar, to say the least. So it doesn't make sense that God would suddenly test his servant's faith. There has been nothing in the narrative to point in the direction of God needing to test Elisha's faith. Well, you might say, well, maybe God just withheld it, but he knew his response, but he just withheld it from him, this one account. But if that's the case, we have to wonder why is God arbitrarily withholding information from Elisha if he's not trying to test his faith? So, I'm going to go with the option that God did reveal the oncoming army to Elisha. But yet Elisha decided not to tell anyone. But we'd have to ask ourselves why. Up to this point, Elisha has been warning the king of Israel about these raiding parties. Why would he not tell the king of Israel now that an army is coming into his own land? Well, because those raiding parties were targeting the king of Israel, this army is targeting Elisha, the man of God. Israel is not in danger. Elisha is in danger. Elisha warned about the raiding parties so that way the king of Israel could protect his people and his land with his own army and his own military. Elisha doesn't trust in the military to protect him. Instead, he trusts in God to preserve him and to protect him and to give him victory even in this case. 
So I'm convinced that Elisha knew this. But then we have to ask, why didn't he warn the town? I mean, if an army is coming, wouldn't it have been the decent thing for Elisha to say, hey, guys, something's coming. Don't freak out. They're coming for me. Just wanted to let you know. I, the reason I don't think he would be in a position to tell the town is because put yourself in the situation. Put yourself in the NPC, the non-playable character that just walks around the village. When you hear that an army is coming for the main character, are you just going to stay around and do nothing? These are armies that they would pillage. They would rape whole towns. So there would probably be a bit of a concern. If the town hears that an army is coming for Elisha, they're given two options. Sorry, three options. One, fortify and defend yourself. Two, give up the man of God. Or three, relocate to another place. Hey, time to move to your, to your wife's mother's house or to your father's house or get away to your cousins. Take that vacation you've always wanted. Use up that sick leave you've been saving for. Call your boss. Get out of town. So I think it's because of all those reasons that Elisha decided not to tell them. He trusts that God is going to deliver him. So he doesn't tell the people of the village so that way they don't defend themselves. But also he doesn't tell them because he doesn't want to cause a panic. If people start leaving town, the army is going to notice that something's up. And remember, the army at this point is used to being tipped away. They are used to somebody telling them that are telling their enemies that they're coming. So they're going to be going on guard. It starts with the army description is horses, then chariots, and a massive army. Speed and power is their main objective right now to get to Elisha. If all of a sudden the, the town starts dispersing, they're going to be more reckless. They're going to just put all in. If we were going at, you know, what we thought was our top speed, now that we are afraid that our target's getting away, we're going to have to be reckless at this point. Everything goes in, guns are blazing. There's going to be collateral damage without a doubt. So Elisha, instead of warning the town, he doesn't. He withholds that information from them. But I think he also withholds the information because somebody is supposed to be tested in this story. But it's not supposed to be the man of God. So let's continue. Let's go on down. Um, so when they wake up, I just have to say, this was what I was envisioning. I couldn't help it. Um, when it. When it mentions the servant coming out early in the morning, and he suddenly sees an army out there. Um, going out early in the morning, the, the servant of the man of God is probably going to give fresh water. He's probably going to the well to bring up some fresh water and to give to his master. So I see in my head, this is I'm picturing, and you got a humor. I, I don't think that the, the servant's response is bad at all. He's probably walking out groggy, dry-eyed, you know. He probably stayed up late, and now he's up early for his master's sake. He goes to the well. He puts his head down, and behind him, you see the armies on the hill. Like They are formed. They are there. The servant pops his head back up. He's like, did I see that right? He turns. He looks. I think I did. He turns again, and he just goes running. I mean, what would you do? You just wake up, okay? You wake up, and there's an army around you. Your boss, your master, he has warned people about these kind of things. Every time a raiding party has come up, he has warned people. Now, all of a sudden, it looks like an army has just sprung out of nowhere, and your master seems caught off guard. So it's not a critique on the servant's part when um, Elijah has to tell him, hey, the numbers around us are more than theirs. The servant's caught off guard. It's plain and simple as that. It's not, I don't want us to have this critique of faith that, that he's rebuking him in some sense, like when Peter is walking on the water and he starts to sink and Jesus says, oh, you have little faith. That's not the issue here. The servant's faith is not in question at this point. So when the Arameans, we're going on to verse 18. If I'm going too fast, I'm so sorry. I just I had too much coffee. Ooh, sorry. When the Arameans came against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, please strike this nation with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, according to Elisha's word. Then Elisha said to them, this is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me. And I will take you to the man you're looking for. 
And he led them to Samaria. When they entered Samaria, Elisha said, Lord, open these men's eyes and let them see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw that they were in the middle of Samaria. So when he's, he's, he's telling them, this is not the way. I just, I picture the scene from the Mandalorian when he's like, you know, whenever the Mandalorians greet each other, he's like, this is the way. So I know that's not how he greeted them. He's not like a Mandalorian, but hey, that's just, that's the scene that comes to my mind is, is Elisha just telling them, this is the way. But they don't respond back with that because they're not Mandalorians. They don't know how to properly respond. So it's interesting. This army is around them. We've seen the army of God done wonderful things from plagues being dropped down to we've seen the, uh, in, uh, the armies of God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. We've seen destruction. We know that if they wanted, they could slay this army at will, that they could just go in with their flaming swords and just lay waste to everybody there. But he doesn't do that. Instead, Elisha says, Lord, strike this nation with blindness. So now this whole army, this whole army that has come, they're now blind. And they have to trust the word of the one that they are sent to capture, to lead them. Now what he does is, Elisha does not lead them out, back to where they came from. He takes them instead to the very middle of Samaria. He takes them to the very middle near the capital where the army is. They open their eyes. He prays, Lord, open these men's eyes and let them see. They open their eyes expecting. Remember, the last thing they saw is Dothan. Now they're expecting to be led away back home. Now they open up and they are in the middle of Samaria. Bad news for an army to suddenly find yourself in the middle of hostile territory. Um, it's a paratrooper's worst nightmare. If you've seen the movie A Bridge Too Far, you know it's the paratroopers that were sent to Arnheim, that they were dropped just too far. Reinforcements couldn't get to them. Supplies could only be dropped to them airlifting. And after a while, you just run out of resources. So this army suddenly finds themselves in the middle of enemy territory. What are they going to do for food? How are they going to get back? The enemy has every advantage. They can set up fortified positions. They can trap you in valleys. The army is doomed at this point. They're at the mercy of the king. So when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, should I kill them? Should I kill them, my father? Now, this is not uh, an uncommon reaction during this time period. Uh, people were not very friendly to their prisoners. The Geneva Convention hadn't been invented yet. Um, it was still might makes right. Destroying armies was one of the most destructive things you could do to a nation because they didn't have standing armies. Uh, today we have, you know, we're, we're, we're used to having a standing army. We're used to having soldiers, farmers, nurses, doctors, um, politicians. We're used to having people fulfill certain roles. Um, as early as the 1700s, standing armies were very common. You find that in France. Uh, Prussia had a certain size standing army. So did England. If you remember, the funding fathers of our country didn't want a standing army initially because they wanted to make it harder for us to go to war and vice versa. So standing armies at this time period are not a common thing. So when you kill this army, what you're doing is you're killing the workers who would be working the fields. Everybody in this army has their own land and their own fields. And as we talked about earlier, being an agricultural society, to destroy their working force is going to cripple them, not just their means of survival, but their very economic uh, force structure is going to be destroyed. So destroying your prisoners when you have the chance, that's going to, put, that's going to really help you out. And at this point, Israel is in the right to do it because these ar this army has been attacking them in bands trying to destroy their harvest. So it'd be an eye for an eye, essentially. Um, treating prisoners horrible was not uncommon. Uh, at the Battle of Clyden in 1014, the, where it was a battle between the Byzantines and the Bulgarians. And the Byzantines won. And so what, what Basil did was he took his 8,000 prisoners and broke them into groups of 100. Out of those groups of 100, he took one man... And he cut out one of his eyes, so he only had one eye. The other 99 people in those groups were all blinded completely. 
And the one man would have to lead those men back. 8,000 men blinded, except for one man out of every hundred. And he was half blinded. That man's job was to lead his blinded companions back home. In Rome, if they defeated chieftains, they would beat them and whip them and then drag them behind a chariot, uh, behind the general's chariot through the streets of Rome, parading them like trophies. So it's not an uncommon request that the king is asking. Should I destroy them? Should I kill them? Elisha replies, don't kill them. Do you kill those you have captured with your sword or bow? Set food and water in front of them so they can eat and drink and go to their master. So he, the king, prepared a big feast for them. When they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. The, Arma the Aramean raiders did not come into Israel's land again. I had mentioned before that some people assumed that this was a test on Elisha's part about his faith. I believe that there is a test happening in this part, but the test was not for Elijah. The test was for the king of Israel. God, as we know, is love, and God is merciful to those who are against him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. It, it says in Romans, while we were still enemies, God sent his son to die for us. That This proves his love for us. So God is merciful to his enemies. And so God wants to be merciful to Israel's enemies. But what God does is God, in his being merciful to his enemies, puts his servants in a position to have to be merciful themselves. The test in this area is to the king of Israel. Will you show mercy to people who have not shown mercy to you? This, this, the scene has been set. The stage is set, sorry. An army, a massive army is blind before the king, put in a vulnerable position of being trapped, cut off from their homeland. The king can easily kill them. They're within his power. He repeats it twice. Should I kill them? Should I kill them? They're there for him to, <clears throat> for the king to either show mercy or to withhold mercy. Up to this point, though, the king of Israel himself has been shown mercy. If we read in 2 Kings chapter 3, it says, Joram, son of Ahab, king over Israel in Samaria during the 18th year of Judah's king Jehoshaphat, and he reigned 12 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but not like his father and mother, for he removed the sacred pillars of Baal his father had made. Nevertheless, Joram clung to the sins that Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to commit and did not turn away from them. The king of Israel was committing evil in the sight of God. But God in his mercy had sent Elisha to him to protect him from foreign, foreign enemies who warned about his raiding parties. He sent him to heal the land. God was being merciful to the king of Israel this whole time. And now he gave the king of Israel a position to be in. I have shown you great mercy. Will you now go and do likewise? The king of Boam, or the king of Israel, seeing blind people before them, surely must have thought of his own heart, of his own people, who are blind themselves. And so he's given a test. Are you going to be merciful, as I've been merciful to you? Or are you going to withhold your hand and not be merciful? Thankfully for, for the king of Israel, and especially thankfully for the people before him, the king doesn't just give them food and water. He makes a feast for them. He makes a feast for them, supplies all their need, and then sends them back. Sends them back as if they were never foes. Because he had received such mercy from God, he could be merciful to his enemies. Dearly beloved, God is the same for us. When we come to him with our attacks and we come to him as these raiders do. God doesn't just give us food and water. He gives us a feast. So the test here is extended even to us. And especially now in an election year of all, of all the time to have this verse given to us. 
It's given to us during an election year. It's given to us in a year in which we have maskers and anti-maskers. We have Republicans and we have Democrats. We, you know, we're divided by what we are and who we are. We're divided by color. We're divided by religion, heritage. We've been, there's a lot, what some would call a lot of justification to not be merciful to one another. So our test is not the test of Elisha. Our test is the test of the king of Israel. When our enemies who hate us and come to do us harm, when they come to us, if they knock on our door, how are we going to treat them? How are we going to behave with them? Are we going to demand an eye for an eye? Or are we going to extend mercy for them? Are we going to go beyond what they need within reason and provide a feast of love for them? I want to conclude with the parable of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus is there. He's taking questions from the Pharisees and the lawyers. And one of them asks, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus asked him. How do you read it? The, fair, the lawyer said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he put on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will reimburse you for whatever ex extra you spend. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The one who showed mercy to him, the lawyer said. Then Jesus told him, Go and do the same. So dearly beloved, when we're offered an opportunity today, whether it's a coworker, whether it's somebody we disagree with politically, whether it's that one person on Facebook, or that uncle or that aunt who just want to cause up or to throw a wrench in your day, or maybe something more profound, maybe it's somebody who honestly despises you because of the color of your skin or because of your religious affiliation or perhaps something else, whatever the cause is. Will you be merciful to them? Remember the king of Israel, he, had, he was justified. Society, culture, the, the, the general norm of the land justified him slaughtering his enemy. But he was merciful to them because he had first received mercy from God. You all have received incredible mercy from God. You have received not only forgiveness of sin, but you have received a spirit that abides in us, that empowers us and allows us to be able to live holy and God-pleasing lives. You have been shown great mercy. Will you too go and do likewise? Will you find the person in your life who despises you and show mercy to them? How the narrative ends is it says that the armies went back to their land and they raided Israel no more. Show love to your enemy. Be as a good Samaritan and regardless of who it is by the side of the road, be merciful to them. Be like the king of Israel. The people who have come expressly to attack you, show them mercy. And what better way to remember to be merciful than in the partaking of the Eucharist? So, this is the end of the sermon, and we now enter into the time of the Eucharist. But go this week, be merciful, because remember, God is faithful. Great is his faithfulness. He will empower us to show love and to show mercy where we have not received love, and where we have not received mercy. God bless. Amen.
At this time in our service, we're going to prepare to receive communion or what is sometimes called the Lord's Supper. And this is a commemoration of the fact that Jesus Christ died a horrible death by the means of an empire-sponsored execution in order to give us the victory over sin and death. It's a practice that opens us up to God and helps us draw closer to him. And it's a practice that God uses to transform us into being more like his son, Jesus Christ. Communion is for anyone who wishes to have a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member of Beacon Christian Church in order to participate. This may be the first time that you've ever worshipped with us, but if you desire to follow Jesus Christ, then you're welcome to join us in communion. We use bread to represent the body of Christ and grape juice to represent the blood of Christ. Uh, if you have these things with you, we'll receive them together as one community in a few moments. If you don't have them with you right now, we're going to have a song in a moment, and perhaps you can go and grab something that will suffice. We want to be able to do this as a faith community. Uh, today's communion meditation is going to be a responsive one, and so when the words appear on your screen, please respond with the designated words. Even if you're watching this by yourself, please respond out loud, because again, we believe that through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, we actually are doing this together as one community. May the Holy One be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the one who guides our life together. It is our joy to offer gratitude and praise. Community of saints, beloved of God, we're invited to come and gather at this table of love and liberation, to feast on the dreams of God, to be nourished by but a taste of what God wants to do among us. God calls us from the institutional halls of power from shelters, from the streets. God calls us from classrooms and pulpits, from bars and prison cells, from the hood, from the holler. God calls us as we are, from wherever we are, to come and be in solidarity with Christ and his people, to be in solidarity with those who live on the margins. God whispers to you, come, Come and live abundantly. Turn from all the claims that blessings flow from money and power and control. Come and live relentlessly, following Christ down paths of uncertainty. Come and take risks for one another. Come and call down unjust power from its throne and lift up the lowly and the impoverished and the burdened. To answer the call of Christ is to find ourselves, no matter our social location, choosing to align ourselves with the marginalized and the oppressed and the outcast and the isolated. With the faith that together we might enflesh new possibilities of healing, of connection, of freedom from all that destroys. When these are the desires of our hearts, we open ourselves up to God. Blessed are those, Jesus said, who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be filled. And so let us come to this table expectant and eager and open to tasting the rich blessings of heaven born from unexpected places and people and experiences. In this meal, we remember the life and death and resurrection of the one who still takes on flesh and lives among us today. On the night that he would be unjustly arrested, Jesus gathered his friends and companions, and in the midst of a tense and dangerous time, they found each other sharing a meal at a table, connecting over the story of God enfleshed among them. And as they did so, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread and shared it with disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he also took the cup and he gave thanks to God and shared it with his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the cup of the new promise between God and humankind sealed with my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of Christ with us and in the assurance of God's love that persists through all things, we offer our lives and our ministries and our church in the service of God's healing work, as we proclaim the mystery of the faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen.
Christ will come again. And so we pray, come Holy Spirit, come breath of God, renewer of life, settle on these gifts and all who gather in this community, that we might be transformed in our remembrance of your radical love, your eternal embrace, and your grace that makes all things new. For the sake of our shared lives, the life of this land in which we live, and the lives of those yet to come, nourish us and renew our hope that soon Christ may rise again among us. Amen. And now I'd like to invite you to take this opportunity uh, to prepare your hearts for uh, communion. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El El Yana Adonai, age to age you're still the same, by the power of your name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, er kam kana Adonai, we will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai. Through your love and through the ram, you saved the son of Abraham. Through the power of your hand, turn the sea into dry land. To the outcast on her knees, you were the God who really sees. By your might you set your children free. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El El Yana Adonai. Age to age, you're still the same by the power of a name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, there come Kana Adonai. We will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai. Through the years you made it clear That the time of Christ was near Though the people could not see What Messiah ought to be Though your word contained the plan It just could not understand your most awesome work was done through the frailty of your Son. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El El Yana Adonai, age to age you're still the same by the power of the name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, there come Kana Adonai, we will praise and lift you high, El Shaddai. And so, friends, in remembrance of Christ's great sacrifice on our behalf, as one community, let us receive the body of Christ, which was broken for us. And as one faith community, let us receive the blood of Christ, which sealed the new promise and was poured out for us. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, for today's service. I would like to invite you uh, in this closing song to reflect on the faithfulness of God, that he is with us, he is our provider. Um, we've worshipped him as our leader, that he leads us uh, evermore. We've seen how he is merciful to us. Yeah, he expects us to be merciful even to our enemies, and that he gives us opportunities to um, really give 
give to the world the love that he's given us. So I invite you that whatever we are dealing, dealing with up to this point or what we're going to be dealing with this week, that we would reflect on the faithfulness of God, that he has gone before us and that he will always be there. So, so come uh, join me as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord unto me. Amen. We just want to share a couple of announcements with you before you head on your way. If you haven't done so yet, please fill out our digital connection card at beaconlex.org slash connection. And uh, the link to that is also in the video description as well. Also, please make sure to take a look at the bulletin. It has some other important announcements and things like that that we want to make sure that you know about. Again, that's in the uh, video description or you can access that at our webpage at beaconlex.org. We're launching a new small group starting the first Sunday in September. Uh, we were going to have a few different small groups, but for various reasons, we've pared that down to one. And it will last six weeks meeting every Sunday evening from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And this is a study called Surprised by Hope. You know, many Christians believe that our future in heaven 
is all that we have to worry about. But the Bible doesn't actually teach that. You know, I've said before that churches have so much to say about life after death that sometimes we leave people wondering if Christianity has anything to say about life before death. And that's part of the idea that this six-session video-based Bible study explores. Uh, it's led by premier Bible scholar N.T. Wright, who, as far as I know, I have no relation to. But N.T. Wright brings us inside the scriptures to grasp the full, breathtaking hope that Jesus offers this world and what the implications are for our lives today. Uh, there's a link to a trailer for this study in the video description and in the bulletin as well. So check that out, and if you want to be a part of this study group, please let us know. There's a link in uh, the video description for a sign-up form. This small group's open to anyone. You don't have to be a member of Beacon Christian Church. You don't have to attend our worship services or watch the videos. Uh, you can invite anyone who you think might be interested in participating. As always, if you're interested in a few minutes of meet and greet, there's a Zoom link in the video description that you can click on, and you can enter the password Beacon Lex. Uh, capital B, and then capital L-E-X. Uh, I like to describe this as that time when you're walking out of the sanctuary and you shake hands and talk with the pastor for a few minutes on your way out. So if that's something that you're interested in, feel free to, to click on that link and join us in that Zoom room. Friends, thank you so much for being a part of the Beacon Community of Faith this morning. Remember that you're deeply, deeply loved by God, and you're deeply loved by the others in this community. Even if we have to worship virtually, even if we've never met in person, please know that you are deeply loved by the people in this community. And so friends, go and live in the light of God's love. Amen.